time of year everybody seems to be decorating uh, for Christmas. Uh, yesterday, Jeremy and I come home from Walmart yesterday evening and found that our last string of lights that we had out on our fence from last year finally blew out. So uh, we have not, I have not because of illnesses and weather and stuff got anything on the outside decorated and very little of anything on the inside decorated but uh, I'll try to get something done tomorrow we'll see how things turn out but anyway uh, I, I have this sermon that I like to preach on symbolism versus substance because I've noticed that there are a lot of people a lot of people, it seems like a lot of people, a lot more than uh, attend churches, really go overboard to decorate for Christmas. People that you never see going to churches on Sunday morning, never see involved in anything good in the community, and people whose lives that you kind of know are no ways near being that of what a Christian ought to be according to what the Bible says. It just seems like they've got the most decorations around. It's kind of like uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, you know, with Chevy Chase, you know, it's just got to do it to outdo the neighbors for whatever reason. And I, it, it, can you believe how many Christmas shows that there are, Christmas movies and such on TV where uh, Christ is really never mentioned and church is never really mentioned. It's just about Christmas and Santa Claus and things of that nature. And that's why I, I talk about the, the difference between symbolism and substance. It's a lot of that decoration is symbolism. And this symbolism presents a great problem when we talk about Christianity. Many people misinterpret symbolism as Christianity. They think if they put up some lights, put up a Christmas tree, tell their children about the baby Jesus, that somehow that makes them Christians. Symbolism is not Christianity in any way, shape, or form. Symbolism cannot replace substantive faith and the search to inherit eternal life. It's a huge mistake. Symbolism can mean a lot out here in the world. You can wear your Dallas Cowboys jersey all you want. You can say, my team won or my team lost. If you're not part of that team, you know, that's... But it might make you feel good or bad, depending on what kind of season they have. But when we're talking about Christianity, we're talking about something very different. So let's delve into this. First of all, uh, New Testament teaches us about that... Well, okay, New Testament Christianity is the essence of God-ordained relationship between God and man. You want to know what Christianity is? Well, hey, we, we talked in Bible class about how words can be can change over time. Christianity is one of those words that has changed over time. So we have to be very uh, definite in our terms of what we mean by Christianity. So I use the term New Testament Christianity. It's what the New Testament talks about. It's not a Christianity that has been diluted okay, with, with traditions of men, uh, with, uh, with uh, ideas coming from men. It's, it's something that is real based upon what the New Testament teaches, and only what the New Testament teaches. New Testament Christianity, that's the essence, that's what God has given us, that's what God has directed. 
Anything else is just assumption that men make. And we can't live on assumptions for very long. We need to define some things. Number one, substance. It's the real or essential part of anything. Substance. Symbolism, on the other hand, is a representation of abstract or intangible things by means of symbols or emblems. We'll delve into that just a little bit more. A symbol of a thing is not the thing itself. We talked about that not too long ago, about a shadow, right? The shadow of something is not the thing itself. It's just the shadow. You really don't have uh, the thing. Now, somebody said, well, you know, if you've got the shadow, you've got the thing. Maybe not. But I'm talking about the essence of it, the substance of it. The shadow is not the substance. The shadow of a thing is not, again, the thing itself. There are many people who live in the shadow of New Testament Christianity, but they have little or no concept of the reality of New Testament Christianity. They know what people have told them about Christianity. They, they know what people have told them about the Bible. And they'll, they'll say, well, they'll say something, say, oh, isn't that what the Bible said? That's what my preacher told me, or that's what my grandmother always told me, or somebody else always told me. No, that's, that's not in the Bible. That's not in the New Testament. So no, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're not even in the shadow when you're talking about something of that nature. So symbolism is not to be confused with substitution. Some people will do that. Uh, this symbol is a substitute for the real thing. All right. Now there are substitutions in New Testament Christianity. All right. A substitute is a person or thing, a person or thing replacing another. New Testament Christianity. Jesus is our substitute on the cross. We deserve to die for our sins. He didn't. But he took our place on the cross. That was a real, that was a substance. He took our place, so he was our substitute. But listen, he didn't do it as a symbol. He did it as a reality. He didn't do it as a shadow. It was a real thing. He really died on the cross because we really deserve to die upon the cross or in whatever form because of our sins. A symbol is not meant to replace a thing. It's merely used to represent a thing. And once we begin to get those things straight, we begin to see how that the symbolism that is out there cannot in any way, shape, or form be New Testament Christianity. Well, let's look at some New Testament teaching here uh, on the danger of symbolic worship and service. And the New Testament does teach us about symbolism. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the symbolism, the shadow, or uh, the substance there. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. And I know we've talked about it a couple times here uh, recently. The Hebrew writer writes, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But... In these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So the law of Moses was not able to take away sins. We understand that, right? So there was something that was wrong with that system. It was not designed to take away sins, but it was designed to show that sin was bad and that sin led to death, so there was a symbol put in there. And that symbol was the animal sacrifices that had to be made for sin. And when they did those things, when they did the symbol in that religion, 
See? Then God passed over the sins waiting for the reality, waiting for the substance of that, uh, what, what he had planned, the substance being Christ on the cross. The law of Moses was not able to take away sins. Its sacrifices and offerings, offerings were only, and catch this, a representation of abstract or intangible things by means of symbols or emblems. Remember that definition we had? Okay. A symbol, a representation of abstract or intangible things. That's what those were, right? Because the death of Christ on the cross was something for them that was abstract. Can't understand this. We can't understand how that God's going to become a human being and die for our sins, be that sacrifice for our sins. It, we, we can't grasp it. We can't get our hands around it. We can't get our minds around it. But they could the animal sacrifice, which then becomes that symbol for it. So that was that abstract and intangible part, the sacrifice of Christ. You know what? For us, it's abstract and intangible, or it was abstract and intangible until Jesus died on the cross, the reality of it. But we understand the symbols that are used here, say, that helps us to get our mind. It's kind of abstract and intangible for us because we don't have the real body and the real blood of Jesus right here, do we? But it reminds us of those things. It helps us to get our minds on that sacrifice that He made on the cross on our behalf. The substitution that He made. Yeah, do, we see Jesus hopefully, dying on the cross. But do we see Him taking our place every time we partake of this? Do we see that? We need to. We, we really should. We live in an age where the substance has been made known and really is the rule, right? It's the rule. And has been since He died upon the cross. Galatians 4, 9. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? Think about what the Apostle Paul is saying. Think about what was going on. You had Christians who had come out of Judaism right? And now they want to go back to Judaism. They want to go back to the temple. They want to go back to offering those animal sacrifices. Paul says, what do you want to do that for? You, you want to leave the reality and go back to the symbols? You want to leave the, the substance and go back to the shadows? Does that make any sense? You want to leave the substance and go back to the symbols of religion? No. And it, it's also, you could translate that out to the Colossian letter. And think about all of the Gentiles and all those pagan religions that were represented there as those people became Christians and the things that they wanted to bring into Christianity from their past religion. And Paul telling them, no, you know, we wouldn't do that with Judaism. Why would you want to do that with all these pagan religions also? Okay? It's not so much clear there, but Paul talks about it. And he says, now look, if you want to take a day off, you know, take a day off. If you want to observe a Sabbath, do it. But you can't impose that on somebody else. You can't tell somebody else they, they have to do it. So we have a lot of this teaching about symbolism and substance in the New Testament. Well, let's look at the danger the danger of symbolic worship and service. And it's presented to us in the scriptures, I think, very plainly. 
John the baptizer, as he's preaching and he's teaching, Pharisees and Sadducees and a lot of people from Jerusalem come down to him. He's out uh, on the east side of the Jordan River, Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, and he's preaching baptism unto the repentance, preparing them for for what? For the remission of sins. When's that going to happen? Well, when Christ dies upon the cross, right? He's getting them ready for it. And these people are coming out to be baptized by him. <coughs> and, you know, the Pharisees and Sadducees were great symbolism, weren't they? But they were miserable failures when it comes to substance in religion. So they want to be baptized by John. <coughs> Why do they want to be baptized by John? What's the popular thing to do? Everybody's doing it. Hey, I'm going to be baptized too. John says, what? Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Baptism without repentance, which his was for repentance, it won't do you any good. It's just like giving a baptismal certificate, right? Without that commitment of a repentance, a change of life, okay? Baptism is just a certificate of human accomplishment. Have you ever kind of wondered sometimes about, you know, you see somebody baptized and, you know, the preacher gives them a certificate of baptism, right? You know, I've got them, I give them to people. But sometimes that's what they want, the certificate. It's just for the certificate. You know, for the, the years that, that, that uh, I, I don't want to say years, it was only a few years that I was involved in prison ministry, uh, the offenders, they don't want to be called inmates, they're offenders, that, you know, they'd show up in Bible class after Bible class, uh, uh, participate in all kinds of things. Why? To get the certificates of completion. Then most of them never grew spiritually. They just wanted to be in the class lots of times so that they could get out of work and get out of their, what they call their houses, okay, their cells. But they really didn't want to grow. They just wanted to have that certificate so that when it came time for parole, they could say, look what I've done. Look what I've done. Look what I've done. And that's what a certificate of baptism in that case for the Pharisees and the Sadducees would have been. You know, John could have just written it up. Why would I get you wet? There it is. There's your certificate. Go on home. It's kind of like what Jesus, well, I'll talk about that in a moment. But, but think about that. Uh, just, just, just a certificate of accomplishment. Nothing changed. Jesus and the rich young ruler, Mark chapter 10, verse 17 through 23. This man, you know, but he comes to Jesus. What one thing do I need to do to inherit eternal life? I've done this and I've done this and I've got all these certificates that I've done these things. What one more thing do I need to do? What, what one thing do you say I need to do? He, he may have already been to John and been baptized, got his certificate down there. Jesus says, keep the law. I, I, I've done this and this and this and this. Got my certificates on that, right? Okay. What one thing do I need to do, Jesus, from you? Jesus says, sell everything that you've got, give the money to the poor, come follow me. What? That's not a certificate. <laughs> That's a commitment. He went away sorrowful. You think about that. Jesus wasn't going to give him a certificate. Jesus says, you got to change. You, you really got to change. You, you, and, and it's really not that it was so important. You know, Jesus doesn't say to everybody, sell everything that you got, give the money to the poor. But he does say to everybody, come follow me. But what Jesus is saying is you've got to get rid of the baggage that's going to keep you from doing what you really need to do. Now, in each of our lives, we got some baggage, don't we? 
we got some baggage it's called sin that we got to get rid of yeah we got to work on it he was this guy wasn't willing to work willing to work on it he just wanted one more thing to do like put up another set of Christmas lights over here and it'll be all right this year you see where his trust was you see where his hope was where it was leading to now at least he was honest he walked away right think about Acts chapter 5 verses 1 through 11 with Ananias and Sapphira see Acts chapter 4 the end of that Barnabas had a piece of property he sold it brought the money laid it at the feet of the Apostles the Apostles used that to feed people there in Jerusalem uh, well why would he do that well there are a lot of reasons but um, one of the big ones was it wouldn't be wouldn't be long before the the uh, the Jews would be persecuting Christians to the point where they wouldn't be allowed to have property and be taken from them he gets rid of it uh, and plus Jerusalem's going to be destroyed in about 40 years Ananias and Sapphira do the same thing but they lay money at the feet of the apostles but they, they say they give it all but they kept some back alright well what did they want they wanted this certificate that said we're big givers we're big givers we gave it all but they didn't they gave the part and you can see the hypocrisy that was there in what they were doing so at least that rich young ruler at least he was honest I'm, I'm not giving anything up okay they were willing to give up what half whatever but but even at that Peter John the Apostles say you know it was yours you could have kept it so you see it, it wasn't incumbent upon them to sell everything that they had, give the money to the church. Not at all. The problem was they lied about it. Right? They lied about what they were doing. Well, isn't that kind of a symbolic thing? There's no substance to that. The lie, the lie was put out there. Look at how great we are. When really they weren't great. There was something wrong. And Jesus kind of explains it, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Their heart is far from me. So, religion founded on symbolism may be the greatest hypocrisy of all. For people who say, Look what I did. Look, look at all these decorations that I put up. Look how many Christmas trees I got in my home. Now listen, please, don't misunderstand me. You can have as many Christmas trees as you want in your home. Okay? You can decorate all you want to. I don't care. We don't do very much. Jeremy's got his little one little Christmas tree up. That's probably the only thing we're going to have this year. And that's fine with me. We never did go tremendously overboard with anything. But we don't judge people on that. Okay? You know why? Because we would be judging people on symbolism. You know what we have to make determinations on? Substance. The substance. So the symbolism may be the greatest hypocrisy of all. But suppose for a moment that God would accept symbolism in place of substance. Can we do that? Can we use our imagination that all of a sudden God says, I will accept. I will accept symbolism in place of substance. In other words, what people do on the outside instead of what what's really in the heart okay so all these people who live like the devil but decorate up their houses for all kinds of stuff you know for for Christmas and for Easter and whatever else you have I'll accept that I'll accept that now do you think that would be fair 
not really. But if God did that, if God accepted symbolic Christianity, wouldn't it also be fair to assume, wouldn't it be logical then that symbolic idolatry would, uh, would be as unacceptable as substantive idolatry? Let me repeat that. If God would accept symbolism in place of substance, is it not logical then that symbolic idolatry would be as unacceptable as substantive idolatry? So what are we talking about? Symbolic idolatry. Our world is filled with objects linked to idolatry. What's today? Sunday. Sunday for people who worship the sun and tomorrow's moon day. And this is December. It's supposed to be the tenth month of the year, right? Till they changed it. But but there's idolatry involved with that, just as there is Janus, January, <laughs> all those months, all right? Uh, what are some of the other idolatrous things that are out there? We've got buildings that are named, uh, we've got planets, like Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Think of all those things that are idolatrous that are around us. And if we use them, even innocently, would that not be substantive, uh, uh, symbolic idolatry? Wouldn't that still be idolatry? How about if we have graven images in our homes? What's a graven image? I don't Angels, figurines of Jesus. How about pictures? You know what pictures used to be called? Photogravures? Yeah. Graven images. You see what happens? If we take the symbolism and say, and, and God would accept that as substantive religion would be also have to take the symbolic idolatry and say that that is substantive idolatry. That would make sense. But God couldn't accept that, could he? Could God wouldn't do that. Or we'd be in a world of hurt, wouldn't we? Open up your wallet. What do you got there? You got dollar bills, right? You got pictures on. Well, yeah, okay, Charlie's broke, but, but 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 you see what I'm saying? We got a little license, right? That's got our picture on it. And all these things. We live in a world where where symbolic idolatry exists. We'd have to go live in a cave somewhere. We couldn't participate in society. And I think God would understand the difference. And God understanding the difference between symbolic idolatry and substantive idolatry, then can't we see that that makes a difference between symbolic Christianity and substantive New Testament idolatry? By putting up lights, having Christmas trees, doesn't make us Christians. It's what comes from the heart. It's the substance of doing what the New Testament teaches. And that's the point of my lesson today. Is it substance or is it symbolism? Who would have the authority to choose which symbol represented which substance? Hey, let's let the government do it. Oh, boy, that's... <laughs> well, let the Catholic Church do it. Don't want to... 
Uh, how about the Protestant church? Uh, how about we let Lance do it? <laughs> uh, you know, oh, I'd rather let God do it. Amen. And I know where God comes down on it, God says he wants a substance, not the symbol. He wants people who honor him from the heart, not with their lips. He wants truth from the heart. <coughs> Symbolic religion praises itself for looking good in a terrible world. Substantive Christianity sees a terrible world and takes steps to improve it to the praise and glory of God. That's what it's about, isn't it? How many people have you heard? You know, oh, I sent a big donation. You know? What are you doing day to day to make the world a better place? There's an old saying, give a man a fish and his wife will have to mow the yard for the rest of her time. No, that's that's, that's that's not it. Give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. Teach a man how to fish and he'll feed himself for the rest of his life. See, that, that's the difference between doing something that helps the world to be a better place and then just doing something symbolic. You, throw, you can throw money at a problem, you'll never solve the problem. Amen. It takes teaching, it takes training to solve problems. Some, some, some things only be solved by money, but you've got to know the difference. Okay? T.S. Eliot wrote these words in his play, Murder in the Cathedral. The last temptation is the greatest treason, to do the right deed for the wrong reason for the wrong reason. And I think a lot of people get messed up because they're doing things for the wrong reason. Because they've been taught that if you do this or do that, and you just do the symbols of religion, you're going to be all right. If you just believe in something, you'll be all right. And that's not what God's Word tells us. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 1, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And I think that's a lot of what, what I was talking about earlier. What, what people, are they just showing off? Because there's no substance to what they're doing. Truly. There's no change in their life that's going on. So, symbolism cannot replace substantive faith in our search to inherit eternal life. It can't. It can't. So, I know we're not fooled by it, but there are so many people out here that don't understand it. The devil's got them fooled. False religion has them fooled. Maybe it's just their own minds that has them fooled. And what is it Mark Twain said? It's easier to fool somebody than it is to convince somebody that they've been fooled. Amen. Yeah, it's pretty tough. We've got to have substantive faith. Jesus in John chapter 3, 5 said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We can't get in there by symbols. We have to get in there by believing, repenting, and obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hey, the lesson is yours. Didn't you do that on time today? Thank you. Thank you for your time and attention. If you have a need, please let your request be made known as we stand and sing.